This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast today is Jungian analyst and author David Shane. He holds a master's degree in clinical social work from the University of Texas at Austin and a diploma in analytical psychology from the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in North America. He has a background as an alcohol and chemical dependency counselor and as a clinical social worker. Now a senior analyst with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, he chairs their ethics committee, is co-founder and past coordinator of the New Orleans Jungian Seminar, and is currently an advisor to the C.G. Jung Society of Baton Rouge. Mr. Shane speaks nationally and internationally on various aspects of Jungian psychology and is a Louisiana poet. His private practice, located in Covington, Louisiana, is centrally located between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. His first book, Divine Tempest, The Hurricane as a Psychic Phenomenon, published by Inner City Books in 1998, and his second book, The War of the Gods in Addiction, C.G. Jung, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Archetypal Evil, published in 2009 by Spring Journal, were the subject of episode 8 of this podcast, when Mr. Shane and I sat down together in 2015 at the Fall Conference of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts here in Chicago. His latest book, Always a Fighting Tiger, Memoirs of an Ordinary LSU Football Fan, was released in 2014 by Tate Publishing, and it is the subject of our talk today. This interview is being recorded on Tuesday, November 27th, 2018, through the magic of Skype. Hi, David. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us here today. When we last spoke, which was about three years ago, we talked about your first two books, and um, it was great meeting you. I, I had heard about you, and I had your book, Divine Tempest, that... Um, Daryl Sharp gave me when I visited him at Inner City Books. And we mostly talked about your book on addiction, The War of the Gods in Addiction. And that has been a very popular episode of this podcast. And we ended it with me saying I, I wanted to talk to you about your memoir that you published um, not too long ago, just a few years ago, about being an LSU, a, a lifelong LSU football fan. And for those people that aren't familiar, LSU is an abbreviation for Louisiana State University. So let's just start with you telling us a little bit about why, as a Jungian analyst, you wrote a book about being a college football fan. Well, um, I don't know that I wrote it because uh, I was a Jungian analyst, but I felt that uh, Jungian psychology always honors uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's Follow Your Bliss. And, um, and I realized that I, uh, I was actually on a retreat at uh, Manresa, a Jesuit men's retreat house on the Mississippi River in Louisiana, and I was sitting in the chapel, and I started having all of these thoughts and memories about uh, LSU football and Tiger Stadium in my childhood, and I started frantic frantically writing down notes about, you know, the different things, and that, that was the beginning of the book, and then I uh, I realized that there was a uh, that I had a number of stories to tell about it and that it was, it, it, I'm not going to write a, <laughs> a traditional uh, biography memoir or anything like that. And this was about the closest to that, that, that I think I'll, I'll have. And uh, it, it really talks about a lot of aspects of my life uh, intersected and informed by uh, my connection to LSU football, especially, you know, um, from childhood, childhood on, yeah. Did you attend LSU? No, I didn't. Um, I I attended uh, 
University of Southwestern Louisiana in Lafayette. Um, I was looking at going to LSU. They actually recruited me uh, in high school, but uh, it, it didn't. It didn't work out. I didn't get a scholarship, and I had to work, so uh, I didn't. I didn't go to LSU. But uh, like lots of people, uh, you know, Notre Dame fans and others, right. uh, you don't have to have gone to the right. To that's the why. Yeah, that's why I wanted to point that out. Is because there there are other things that factor into why we are a fan of what we are a fan of, and I think that that's something that I want to talk about here. And I think that that's important. And I'd like you to explain to us, because anybody looking through this book, you were into it and you still are. And, and your family is, and I love it. And why I had mentioned, you know, you being a Jungian analyst and writing this book is that I think that people wouldn't expect, right, a psychologist to be so into sports because I myself am a lifelong football fan. For me, it's the NFL and people just don't get it. They don't understand. And it. some people are turned off by it when I bring it up. So that's what we're here to talk about today is what's really going on underneath all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, I, I, I think that there are prejudices everywhere in this world (laughs) and all prejudice is to me is a prejudgment that's that's what the word means and um and the prejudice by some people is that somehow sports and activity that those kinds of activities and fans are are somehow um uh, that it, it's it's that it's kind of pedestrian and mm-hmm. and almost lower class and right. uh, and and it's not very intellectual and mm-hmm. uh, which I would say are all untrue but um, you know it's almost like nobody's going to fault you unless you're sitting in a a bar in Brooklyn about talking about art <laughs> if you love or talking about poetry if you love. Um, but it's just really that different people, uh, you know, you know, uh, it's not their cup of tea. And so the tendency is if something's not our cup of tea, that we tend to diss it or to think it's irrelevant or stupid or Mm -hmm. or nonsense, a waste of time, et cetera. Um, just look at like, like how people choose to spend their money, uh, on, recreational activity you know what some people love golf and they spend lots of money on golf or fishing or uh you know other things uh that that are are sports or or hobbies etc and um but if it's not your hobby <laughs> then you, you know you think well why would you want to do that mm-hmm. you know because it doesn't resonate for you but something that resonates for you you don't understand why other people aren't as enthusiastic about it as you are. Mm-hmm. And that's just really differences in, in interest and taste and temperament, that, that kind of thing explains that, you know? Um, and I think for me, one of the things that comes into question when I look at my own interests is that this is a spectator sport, right? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're not out there playing. We are watching other people playing. But that's been around forever. Sports has been around forever. Um, You know, like you and I were were talking earlier and you said that, you know, who was the fastest runner in the village, right? Mm -hmm. So how did this all start with us watching other people engaging in a competitive activity? Well, I, I, I believe that at the core of this is a, a participation mystique with the, which the anthropologists uh, actually coined as as an identification of the individual with either a collective or an animal or a, some t- type of totem, and so that that 
uh, object or, or animal or collective actually carries a piece of that person's identity. And I think that um, sports fans, and, and I think going way back and even now, it, you know, it's like, well, first of all, like, like, like that um, there are lots of definitions for sport, mm -hmm. but what we're talking about, I think, inherently has an element of competition. Okay, um, and and it could be individual or it can be collective. In in the cases where where people uh, are identifying with a team, for example, or a team in a city, or USA in the Olympics, there's an identification uh, with the collective so that people feel a part of that. It's almost like they, they, they didn't score the hockey puck or win the basketball game or the football game, but because they identify and root for and pull for whatever team that is, they feel a sense of their participation in that, you know. Um, and there is actually an element of that. I mean, at Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge, and I talk about this in the book, you know, a lot of people or some people think that, you know, fans just watch the game and, and they don't really have an effect on, on the game. And that's just not true. You know, the sports people, the betters will tell you that home, home field advantage gives you advantage in the game points. I mean, it's traditional that if a team plays LSU in Tiger Stadium, that gives us seven points to start with, you know. So now would um, you say that that had to do, because this is an interest of mine, would that have to do with the players being more comfortable because they're in familiar surroundings, their, their home stadium, they're in their home um, facility, and they don't have to travel, they don't have to go through the stresses of that? I, or would you hard. say... Yeah, uh, the energy, the psychic energy of the fans in the stadium and Tiger Stadium, just for people who don't know, is the stadium that LSU football plays in. And the title of your book, Always a Fighting Tiger, the LSU football team mascot is the tiger, uh, hence the title. So would you say that the and, and and what I was going to say is, doesn't that stadium hold over 100,000 people? Yeah, it holds 102,000. Uh -huh. That is incredible. That is a more than NFL football stadiums. That the amount of yeah. energy of the yeah. fans, and of course, they're not all LSU fans. There's some visitors, but the majority, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, are and, the and, LSU fans. Go ahead. And you know, and, and, you know, just particularly LSU fans are, are very knowledgeable and, and tuned into the game and they know when to make noise and mm -hmm. when to be quiet mm -hmm. and, and when to cheer for what. And, um, and I've actually seen, you know, I mean, the, the, these, these boys in high, in college are, you know, they're just basically, you know, young men. And so they, they aren't, uh, hardened and seasoned, you know, mm -hmm. uh, professionals. And so they are, I think, even more influenceable by, um, the, you know, the, the cheering of the crowd mm -hmm. and the collective energy that goes down to them. And I've seen times when they were exhausted and tired and, and, and the crowd, uh, roared up and they felt it and, and they played harder and they dug deeper and that happens. Uh, and I, not, not just at LSU, but I mean, I've right. seen that all, all kinds of places that I've watched ball games. And so I do think that the, the fan and, and when, when you have a, uh, a loud, passionate, vocal fan base, I think it makes a difference. It does. Uh, no, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not going to, it's not going to make you beat Alabama because you got to have the players and the scheme and all that, but it's part of the picture, definitely, of how the players perform, you know. And you uh, mentioned uh, participation mystique and uh, Dr. Mark Winborn is a frequent guest on this podcast and, and he wrote a book called Shared Realities and uh, we spoke about participation mystique when he was on the show and 
what what would you have to say about why what we get out of it i'm I, what i want to get to is where does the projection come in and just because it's a projection and we're having this team carry something for us doesn't make it bad or wrong it it's fulfilling something a need in us would you say a need well yeah i th- i think the need um at base, to me, there are there's sort of two basic needs psychologically, and that one is to be an individual, and the other is to belong. And, mm-hmm. and it, these are directly sometimes in opposition. But the, being a, a sports fan uh, and the participation mystique um, plays into the part of, of belonging, that you know we're part of a family. Where I mean, it's sort of interesting what what people uh, do with the sports. You know, it's the uh, you know Florida talks about the Gator Nation. You know, and and people talk about the tribe and and for for cities that you know like with uh, t- NFL teams and stuff. They th- that team represents their city, and and so there, there's a there's a pride and an investment and. You know, and and I think it can be too much. I mean, uh, you know, people can can have too much dependent upon that in terms of self esteem. You know, uh, when the Saints are playing terrible, um, then you know <laughs> there's sort of a a depressive cloud over the whole city of New Orleans. You know, yeah. but when they're playing good, I'm telling you, individual self esteem seems to go up. There's more bounce in people's step. Etc. So it does have a, a a positive and a negative psychological effect uh, on people, um, and and it 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 can also um, you know help in terms of uh, I don't want to sort of overplay this, but you know for someone who's who's down and depressed and struggling. Yeah. Uh, and they have a team that is, uh, you know, is that they love and they, and is playing hard and 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 winning or pulls out, a, a, you know, that can have a positive effect on on that person's mood and mental health, and um, that's a that's a good thing. And that's you know? a good thing, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you had shared with me that you went through um, a health crisis of your own. And I believe that perhaps you being an LSU fan may have helped you through that. Would you share a little bit about that with us? But yeah, I, uh, one of the things about, uh, LSU football is that we, we, we haven't had the, the biggest and the best athletes, but we've always had a tradition of, in a sense, playing above our heads. It's kind of a inferiority complex. It's going to prove everybody wrong. And we played that way for many years. And so we would play toe to toe with better teams and, uh, and in t- at times beat them, you know, uh, just because of this, um, this fighting spirit, the fighting mm-hmm. tigers, uh, actually goes back to the civil war. And, um, that name came from a group of Louisiana, uh, soldiers, uh, Confederates, who were known as the fiercest, toughest, uh, hardest drinking, gambling <laughs> uh, group in the Civil War, mm-hmm. and and so the Fighting Tigers began to be that kind of a a never say die spirit, and um, that came on, and 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 so that that has been carried in the tradition. And if you grow up in Louisiana, you're influenced by that. You know, people talk about. Um, purple and gold are the colors of LSU, and they they talk about this identification, and they say they bleed purple and gold, you know, yeah. which is another way of saying uh, how how integral to their DNA is that that football. I mean, LSU, and <clears throat> so for me, I grew up with that, and I, um, I mean, part of that inspired me uh, as a kid, and in terms of always trying my hardest and never giving up. And anyway, when I had this uh, 
a health crisis, a brain tumor, and I, I would say it almost took me out, and I had a, a lot of recovery. Um, it, it was that that never give up at times when I felt like giving up um, yeah. that was inspired by Yeah. By the tigers. Yeah. I know. I know. And that was fairly recently. That was only five years ago that you went through that. And, um, you know, I think that you were touch and go there for a while, weren't you? Yeah. 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 I, uh, I, you know, there was a point in, in my process, and I don't want to wallow in this, but it, you know, it, I mean, I realized at a certain point that sometimes in life, um, living and dying is really a choice about whether you want to continue to live or not, yeah. or you give up. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I battled with that and, um, and part of the help my help, you know, was the grace of God and good friends, but it was also right. it was also LSU football, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so you know, we can look at sports obviously and we'll talk about it. It does have a shadow side. Um, but it can also give solace and comfort and inspiration and that's a great thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it can bond people yeah. in ways that other things can't. Yeah. Um, that when we're all pulling together for the same thing, th th that helps relationships <laughs> because there's so many things in this world that divide us. Uh, you know, um, I don't need to name them, but you know. Right. And I'm sure you could tell lots of stories about people that you've met, other fans, or players. And from my experience with the NFL, I have seen, I have witnessed people of different races, different ages, different religions, men and women, um, form bonds. And people who I think would not have met you know, under really any other circumstance, if it weren't for the team or for this sport, and to see the how how we unite with each other and bond with each other over this it's it's about more than football you know it's about more than the sport it's about relationships and it's about the human spirit and about our our physicality and human excellence and that's one of the things that i love about football is the discipline of the athletes and the, the their performance and watching that and admiring it and but there there's just so many levels to this like you were saying about cities and I am a New England Patriots fan for um for a very different reason I don't live in New England and and, and I never have but a good friend of mine is the head coach of the New England Patriots and has been uh, since 2000. So I've been a Patriots fan for a really long time. And I love being in that stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts, um, outside of Boston. Like I said, I've never lived in New England. I'm a native New Yorker. I live in Chicago now. Um, but mm -hmm. I travel to games. And when I'm in that stadium and hearing that, that New England accent, and mm -hmm. seeing yeah. how into it, these fans are and how, like you were saying, how knowledgeable they are. They know what's going on on the field. And I think you kind of have to, unless somebody you know, kind of gave you a ticket so that you can go there and have an experience. It takes dedication to be a season ticket holder and oh, to yeah. show up. Yeah. yeah. In all kinds of weather. Well, and, and, and that's really what I was trying to say in the title of my book, always a fighting tiger it's always, you know, it, you don't abandon your team. If, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had stretches of, yeah. you know, losing seasons and we still went and we still showed up and we still stayed till the end 
of the game. That that's part of our tradition, no matter what. And you know, going back to what you were saying, uh, you know, I think is an important part of this that some people don't appreciate. They say, well, why? You know, the game's over. Why don't you leave? And and you know, you're way ahead. And I, in my response to that is, well, for the same reason that you don't leave. Uh, a Romeo and Juliet performance mm. because you know they're all going to die at the end. You <laughs> you stay for the performance. That could yeah. be a great a great representation on stage. The way that that's expressed and that can happen any time in a football game. You know, mm. um, so we you know we my brothers and I we we honor you know the players and the team because it, to me it's a, it's a sign of respect that you stay to the end, just like it would be a sign of respect not to get up and walk out the theater to, with Romeo and Juliet. Everybody would look at you like, what, what is wrong with you? You know? Mm -hmm. So I feel the same way about, uh, about what, what those, uh, those guys are doing or any athletes are doing out on the court or on the field, et cetera. You know, it mm -hmm. should be honored and respected. They're, they're in most cases, they're given their all, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's something that we should appreciate and respect and honor. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to look at this maybe metaphorically, the practice that they, that the athletes go through before the game, the memorizing the playbook, learning the playbook, having to get along with teammates that they might not necessarily be friends with if they weren't on the same team. Do you know what I mean? There's so many aspects of this and then the the preparation for the game and the the being part of a team and the responsibilities that that entails. And I think that people don't tend to look at all of that. They just kind of, for the most part in general, look at the, the, the damaging aspects of the game, um, that football is violent, you know, and sports are bad and how sports have become perverted and it's just a money making thing. And that's when I want to talk about the shadow side of it because yeah, that's absolutely. there too. Yeah. And, and, and I was wondering, and that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you would say a little bit about mm -hmm. the shadow side of all this. Well, it, it, Everything has a shadow, and and that is everything. Every person, every collective, every everything has a shadow. And in Jungian psychology, we believe that part of our being conscious is taking into account what that shadow is and integrating that. So, uh, you know, for example, people don't want to believe if they're pulling for a team that their team cheated, you know, yeah. or did something, broke the rules, et cetera. Um, but that is shadow. There's the temptation to, to win at any cost. And, and that gets very shadowy. Um, you know, there, there's money, there's, there's unbelievable money involved in sports. And, and there are people who are trying to manipulate that, uh, not in terms of legitimate sport, but in terms of, you know, making profits or, or, uh, not having a level playing field or, you know, having an advantage. I mean, you know, you have athletes who, uh, you know, for all levels, you know, try to enhance their performance through illegal methods, steroids and, you know, uh, and boosting stuff so that, so that then that's not a level playing field, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, when Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and all those guys hit, you know, the home runs and set all those records, you, you have to stop and say, but that was the steroid era. I mean, so so how can you compare that to regular, normal, you know, building up? So the performance enhancing drugs have been banned because it um, it creates a, a, a disbalance and it also it also has uh, people not trust it anymore, you know, and feel like, well, this isn't legitimate. Or the guy threw the, the boxing match, you know, mm -hmm. so he could, he could, or there, you know, the point shaving in, in basketball or football or anything. Th those are all temptations uh, that are shadow driven. Um, but 
they don't do not take away from um, the excellence and the grandeur and the and the bonding and the positive aspects. I mean, it's it's like I tell tell my clients all the time, you know, uh, when they're looking at situations, I say, you know, look, you you know, you get credit for the good stuff you do, and you're responsible for the bad stuff you do, and the good stuff you do doesn't erase the bad stuff and the bad stuff doesn't erase the good stuff. And they both stand on their own and have to be acknowledged and dealt with and owned. And so that, that's what I would say about sports or, or anything else, you know, that, um, that we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bath water or burn down the born to get the rats out or however, all those metaphors about, mm-hmm doing away with things that have inherent value because of some negative aspect of it, you know? Uh, And I do think that that that's always a danger in sports because winners and losers and, uh, and you know, that, that, that becomes sometimes way more important than playing, you know, Mm. and, uh, it's interesting that we talk about sports as playing, and it really is at heart um, recreational and not not life and death, you know. Uh, and when people make it into life and death, and then they exaggerate its significance, that's that's shadow stuff, you know. Um, that's not seeing things in proportion and balance. There are many more important things going on in this world than sports activities, but sports activities is is an important, significant piece of society, and for many people, uh, it, it it is a very positive thing. So I'm not saying it's it's irrelevant, and I'm not, but it's also not the most important thing going on, and so sometimes people lose their perspective on that. One of the things I wanted to talk about was sports and academics and sports in school. Sports in schools from a very young age through college and then perhaps into the pros and the the competitiveness and the parental participation or the parental pressure on children in in our country, because that's that's all I know is I'll speak mm-hmm. about here in the United States. What is behind that? I I mean, be, the reason why I mention it and and I brought this up with Del McNeely in our episode about how I it's I, I got to the point where I was seeing that the extracurricular activities in schools seem to be more important than the academics. Well, I I think that there can be an overemphasis um, because it, it it's what again it's I think sports is is like let's just take high school. I mean, if your team wins the state championship in something, then people know your school, and yeah. they and if you played on that team, then you get cred for that. That boosts you know, your self-esteem and stuff. So there's a lot of identification. Uh, sadly, there's not as much a claim for, you know, the boy or girl that makes the straight A's and in school. Though, you know, there, it, it, it's acknowledged, but it, it's it not, not the immediacy of the winning team. And I think with the situation with parents is um, there are many... Uh, men and women, moms and dads, who um, are actually uh, living out uh, through their children things mm-hmm. that they didn't get to live out maybe their own life. Let's say there's a dad who played sports, but he wasn't maybe the best athlete, and his son's a star quarterback, you know, uh, for the football team. Then then the dad gets over-invested in that son not making mistakes and being a success and and that kind of thing and so then they cross the line they blur between their son or daughter playing a sport on a team and themselves it's like somehow 
you know, if the son or daughter loses the game or makes a mistake, they've lost the game and made a mistake. Yeah. And, uh, and so they get very upset and critical and, um, and sometimes it gets, uh, it gets violent and dangerous, you know? Um, and, uh, and, th- and that's gone, that's kind of gone crazy in our society these days. I mean, you know, uh, all the way from, you know, bitty league all the way up because this, this competitiveness, this win at any cost has gotten so big that people have lost perspective on what the value of sports is going back to what you said about, you know, I was thinking, so, so what the kids learn in sports from the lowest levels up, well, they learn how to be on a team. Yeah. They learn how to win and lose. They learn how to, to, to recognize that they're better than some people and not as good as others. Um, you, you know, they, they have to deal with success and failure. I mean, there's so many lessons that sports teaches kids if they're, if it's appropriate that it, that I think it's a the great socializing, yeah. uh, phenomena and and you can't necessarily get that in other other kinds of extracurricular activities which, which can be wonderful you know um uh, and have have aspects of it but not quite the same way as um as sports seems to have yeah. and and it, it learn a lot a lot of um if they learn it Correctly, they learn about patience and tolerance and understanding and acceptance of others and uh, and failure and and their own mistakes and you know <laughs> so it, it's a it's a it's a great crucible of uh, of opportunity uh, to grow and learn if, if it's in, if it's done appropriately you know? yeah um, and, and how to work with others because as just hearing you talk right now it's helping me to realize why maybe being on, you know, having the champion debate team or chess team isn't held in the same regard as having the championship football team or baseball team or basketball team. And that this is all fitting now because I do believe that, um, sports does help us to learn how to work with others and although you're part of a team be the best you can be and you know they talk in in football about i just have been hearing a lot of this lately about why do you do this what are you doing this for you know what are you playing for we're playing for our families we're playing for the guys standing next to us you know we don't want to let him down so that's why i'm going to do my best today because I don't want to let my teammate down. Right. It, it's the same kind of bonding. And I do not mean to compare mm-hmm. soldiers at war with, with, with teams and team sports, but the bonding element, the, the giving it your all is about the teammates and, and not letting them down and getting their back and, and, uh, you know, so some of that phenomena is the same as, as soldiers have in war. It's their motivation to keep fighting and stay alive. You know, um, it, it is, it's, it's similar. Um, it's not life and death again, but it, it, there is that kind of motivation and reason for why, uh, people do what they do and why they, um, push themselves uh, beyond what they think they can do. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's also interesting that, you know, as you're talking, because, you know, uh, like individual sports, like uh, golf or tennis or, uh, you know, other things, I mean, there are elements in that, but it, it, it more of that depends upon you, the individual, mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily have to learn the social skills and the relational yeah. and the team effort skills that you do with a team sport. And I think that that's really important in society, you know, that uh, kids are socialized in uh, knowing how to do that, you know, um, but you can't do if, if it all just depends on you and your performance. Uh, you don't learn the same mm-hmm. kinds of having to work with um 
other people's abilities and disabilities, you know. Right. Um, and, and you do have to do that if you're on a team. You know? mm-hmm. uh, well, speaking of that, uh, of individual sports, I'd like to look at individual athletes that have gained recognition um, at the top of their of their sport, such as Tiger Woods. And I was reading a little bit about him last night. I was kind of refreshing my memory on how he was at the pinnacle of, of the sport of golf, and then he came crashing down. And there have been notable cases of that in sports, but also outside of sports. And when somebody becomes that large, that that huge of a figure like Elvis Presley or Marilyn Monroe or Michael Jackson. And they get to that point where they cannot possibly carry that archetypal projection any longer. Would you say a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I I mean, particularly in relation to sports, um, that's the danger. Um, I mean, you know, that, that maybe, you know, Tiger Woods, uh, you know, Billy Cannon, the, the Heisman Trophy winner. And, you know, there are other, other, I mean, even O.J. Simpson. O. Simpson. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's like, it's like that, that somehow you, you're no longer a human being and, 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 um, and have to go according to the rules of other humans. It's almost like you're a god. And you make your own rules. Well, and of course, that's an inflation and that's a grandiosity. But those archetypal projections from society and, you know, people who are adoring, you know, Marilyn Monroe as the sex goddess and Elvis is the king and, you know, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer in history and, uh, you know, just go on and on and on. That puts tremendous pressure, inflationary pressure, and Jung talked about um, that we should never identify with an archetype because it is so dangerous, it is so powerful. Now, I'm not saying these people are consciously realizing that that's what they're doing, but that is what they're doing, and and it ultimately... Um, it ultimately is too much of a of a projection to carry. Uh, we're just human beings. We're, we're not archetypes. And and when we're asked to be a god, uh, there's no human that I know, um, except maybe one, who who could do that. You know. Um, and so I I think that ultimately destroys. Uh, or has the potential to destroy a great great athletes because of their greatness. Um, and so I think just like with saints, uh, real saints, uh, <laughs> they, you know, the, the key to not succumbing to inflation uh, and, and grandiosity and pride that is going to be your undoing is humility is, is being grounded and, and I think that the good athletes, the great athletes who can hold on to their humanness and their humility have a better chance to, you know, to, to keep it going. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to be bragging on my guy here in New Orleans, but I think Drew Brees is just, I mean, if he's for real, he's a really humble, genuine, but great, great NFL quarterback, you know. Uh, but I don't see him succumbing to uh, to that, or 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 Peyton Manning, you know, uh, who was really great too. And so anyway, I don't, you know, there 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 are athletes who haven't succumbed to that, but it is a temptation for any athlete who is really great or excellent at any stage in any sport, you know, from high school or grammar school on up, that that begins to undo them. You know, so the um, danger then is in identifying with the archetype consciously or unconsciously. And and that's what brings about the fall. Yes, it's the it's that the person can't carry um the the weight of the archetypal um 
projection and even what they are trying, they, they may be identifying with it themselves and then they get it projected on them, et cetera. You know, the, the guy who I think is sort of amazing uh, in sports uh, was Muhammad Ali. <laughs> because, you know, he said, I'm the greatest. And I, you know, I could float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And, and yet, somehow Muhammad Ali seemed to, even with that kind of, you know, playing around and, and those statements, he was able to hold on to a certain humbleness and humanity that most athletes couldn't if they had gotten there, you know. And he, he may have been the greatest, you know. Um, he certainly was one of the best that ever was um, in boxing. And so you're saying that that's why he didn't, you know, kind of crash and burn is because he maintained that groundedness and that, in in that and that humility. And the ones who don't, the they kind of fall off the deep end. Right, and I, I and not that I'm advocating for any particular thing in terms of that, but I do think that Muhammad Ali's participation in uh, the black Muslims uh, w w helped him to do that grounding and yes. to realize uh, the values that were ultimately more important. And then and it allowed him to have the forum to do so much good in the world afterwards, too, you know. Mm. And a lot of these guys don't wind up doing that. They don't wind up contributing and giving back to society and the world. You know? Right. And that's right. great when an athlete does that. You know, I, I think it's wonderful when they are a great athlete and then they make lots of money and, and they have high profile and they use that to make the world a better place. I yes. think that's wonderful. You know? So what would you say about the preponderance of scandals that have been occurring on the college scene as far as maybe because sports is so big in this country, so big that the other side is going to be equally as big? Well, I think the pressures are, have gotten uh, crazy at all yeah. levels of sports. I mean, you know, college coaches, I mean, you know, used to be, you know, you, you could have a losing season and and or two, or have a rebuilding year. And now it's like, you know, they it, it's a win now. The expediency is if you can't do it now, you're gone. And and so that that has created so much pressure on on coaches and players at all levels. Um, that it's it, it is I think creating this whole destructiveness that it's like win at any cost and in any way that you can do it that's what's most important you know I I look at uh, you know I was really sad for Lance Armstrong but you know he he cheated <laughs> mm -hmm. and he denied it and he denied it and he denied it and he won and he was really big and he was acclaimed but it was a it was a it 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 was a, a, a pyrrhic victory, you know, because yes. ultimately he was undone because he was doping, you know, and uh, and so. I, but but I think the point I'm making is that the pressure on people, especially if they're good athletes, to get the little edge in a way that isn't you know the legally sanctioned thing. There's the temptation to do that all the time you know you know people want to get bigger and faster and stronger and and whatever but there are are traditional legitimate ways to do that and then there are the illegitimate ways and the temptation is always going to be there for athletes to take the illegitimate road you know um, how did we get here from back decades ago where it was there was a more patient vibe around a head coach having a few losing seasons and you know st sticking it out and having some staying power to now you know c kind of win or you're fired how did we what changed how did we get here well uh this may be way too broad a stroke on this but i think um our society 
overall has moved uh, to a much more um, narcissistic position. There's there's no delayed gratification anymore. Uh, everybody wants everything now, <laughs> uh, and and so there isn't even built in anymore the patience that says you have to work for it. I mean, you know, kids coming out of college want to start at the top of the of the business. You know, yeah. you can't do that. And 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 you just see this all the time. And, and they don't want to pay their dues. And um and and not just the kids. I mean, I, I you know, I'm a baby boomer, and I. Uh, you know, we, we, what, what have we done? We have mortgaged the future and inheritance of our kids with our self-indulgence, you know, um, in general, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's like I think that this, there's a culture that has permeate, that permeates everything right now. Um, the whole selfie stuff, I think, is crazy. You know, everybody's doing selfies, you know, I mean. I mean, we used to call that narcissistic exhibitionism. I don't know what it is now, but it's like it's okay, you know, uh, for everybody. Um, I still don't like it a lot, you know. Um, but I'm just saying that the culture, that, that that's all happened in the culture, and sports is a part of whatever culture it's in. And so the showboating stuff that you see athletes do now, back when I was coming up, if you did any of that, we used to call it hot dog, and you were out the game, you were yeah. on the bench, and you didn't play again that game, you know? Now, guys are doing that, and people all the time, and it's kind of like, oh, that's part of the entertainment, right. you know? And But it's, it's I, I think we've lost something in what I think was a really important value of sportsmanship, you know? Yes. Um, Used to be, uh, it wasn't unusual for a player in football at any level to help another player up off the ground. Mm-hmm. You don't do that now. You don't. You don't help the enemy, the, the other side. You know what I'm saying? It's right. it's like you don't do it. There's a whole different mentality in regards to things. I mean, there still is sportsmanship, thank God, in places, and and I, I, I'm always glad when I see that. But I also see this other part that's permeated by the culture and the, the people who are playing sports now come from that culture. And so that's part of what's sort of out of balance tremendously right now in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's always kind of bothered me about team sports and football in particular is that there's always a loser, and I always felt bad. As much mm-hmm. as I love when my team wins, there's always a part, there's this other part of me that winces, you know, that somebody lost, somebody's devastated, a whole team, a whole team, a whole organization, their family members, their friends, their fans, that's a lot of people. So sometimes it's hard for me to balance it. Do you know what I mean? And I think that maybe that's a good thing because I am seeing the other side. I'm not trying to look, look I'm just using this as an example. People yeah, sending yeah. me emails over this. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that it is, I think, a, a positive sign uh, to my psychological health that I am not thinking of th- I don't, you know, I don't care about this, this other team that lost, you know, good and they deserved it or, or anything like that. I, I always feel bad because I know how bad it feels when you lose. And, and so would you? I think what you're saying, Laura, is, is part of what I, 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 I was saying in terms of the culture that, um, that we've lost an element of, uh, of compassion. Yeah in sports that we used to have and and with that there's there's a respect for your opponent you know right um and even if you best them um you still respect them you still still treat them you know yeah uh, an honorable way and so you don't 
you don't taunt them and you and you don't trash talk and you I mean at least the way I grew up you didn't but now that that sort of is more acceptable and and I think we've lost something really important if we can't um we can't recognize that there is the other side. Of course, if you play sports long enough, you get to taste both sides. <laughs> so then yeah. that gets to build in a little bit more understanding and compassion. If you win all the time, then you, you don't think much of losers. you know. But all of a sudden, if you're on that side, then you know how it feels and you know how how good it feels to have the opponent come up and say, um, you guys played a great game. Right. Even though you lost, you know? Right. Um, they don't have to say that last line, but, uh, you know, it, it's like there's something in that that's redeeming. Um, and it means a lot to when you've given your all and the other, the other side, even though they're enjoying and victorious, that they can recognize and and respect the effort that you made, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this is reminding me of of a story that I had just recently heard. There was a about a thirty minute film made about Bill Belichick's father, Steve Belichick, who was a longtime assistant football coach at Navy, and mm -hmm. you know the big rivalry <laughs> between Navy and Army in football, too, and in. Uh, they're interviewing uh, one of Coach Belichick's players, and he said that one year Army beat Navy, and after the game, um, he was, this Navy player, was making these disparaging remarks about the Army players, and Coach Belichick, Bill's father Steve, happened to hear him. And when they were leaving the locker room, they saw each other in the tunnel and Steve Belichick pulled this player aside and said, I, I heard what you said about the army players. And he said, you know, they may be your enemy on the football field, but one day you may be beside them on the battlefield. Well, cut to many years later and this Na Navy player, this ex Navy player was, um, after 9-11, he, he was in the Navy and um, a commander or something. And I'm sorry if I'm not getting all the details correct, but um, he was, after 9-11, he was sitting in a meeting and across the table, he recognizes somebody. He's like, he looks familiar. Well, it turned out that it was an army guy who was on the field with him that day on that football team. So they were playing against each other one day years later they're working together after 911 both being in their respective branches of the of the uh, military so i didn't tell that story nearly as well as he did in the film so i'll put a link to that <laughs> on the website it's called stories of service yeah that's exactly the 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 value that we're talking about it reminds me of uh you know, uh, moral rivals in high school, they wind up playing on the same college team, you know, mm -hmm. or college teams that, uh, you know, are, are bitter rivals in college. And then these players wind up on the same pro team together as yep. teammates. And, you know, so, 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 you know, sometimes it's really is important to take the long view and, um, you know, I mean, this is totally different, but I, I was a camp counselor for many years. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I never thought that the my campers and how I was dealing with them, someday I was going to be sitting across the table and they were going to be my peers as counselors, you know. And there were oh, some wow. things I regretted about the way I handled myself then. And I, if I had somehow thought of that I might have tempered a little bit of my mm -hmm. temper you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah so I, I think that's a that that that's a, a wonderful illustration of uh, uh of trying to bring the civility and compassion and respect and uh in, in, into the picture yeah mm -hmm. yeah I was wondering if you wanted to mention your poem that you had told me about the lesser is always the jealous critic is that a line from one of your poems? 
Well, it's a, it's well, yeah, it's just a line that I, I don't have the poem, but that that was just a, a a quote that I my observation was that people who who are who are always you know critical and negative and you know sort of putting other people down that my observation is that the the lesser is always the jealous critic in that um that 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 people who feel adequate themselves don't have the need to have to put other people down and to criticize other people um and yet my observation is that the people who do that ultimately have the lowest self esteem you know um and uh and and that fuels it and, and and but but again i think when you when people do that uh they may think that they've you know pushed themselves up but mm-hmm. they've it's a pyrrhic victory again you know yeah. the cost is way too much you know yeah. uh, that's why i always advise people you know i said look you can you have every right to take the low road on this one okay but my experience is that it's always better to take the high road. <laughs> so, so I encourage people to to uh, to think uh, bigger and more compassionately and forgiving and understanding than to come out of their anger and bitterness and you know having felt like they got dissed or something, you know that yeah. kind of thing. And that's I have so. to say that, but that's hard to do when we're in a complex. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You gotta wait that's it why out. we need to be, that's why we need to be reminded of it exactly <laughs> yeah wait it out it's like, it's like to to sleep on it or to decide do i really want to say that that way you know mm, let me think about it you know yeah. so and I, I don't think the count to 10 is long enough i think it's uh <laughs> no i, I got at least i have to at least uh, have a night to sleep on it at least yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, David. And uh, on behalf of all the listeners, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. And thank you for your time today. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on what was discussed here today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. This podcast is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your shows. Also on the website are links to all of the books by all of the guests and a whole page outlining Jung's published works. And there are now links to two online video courses made available through the Jung Society of Washington, D.C. that you can start anytime, go at your own pace, and have lifetime access to the materials please sign up through the links on our website. With special thanks to Daryl Sharp and Liz Jefferson at Inner City Books, to Laura Newton, Mark Winborn, Charlie Arthur, and Diane Braden, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Young.